If you love classic cars, then Donald loves you. Nick Begovich loved interesting engineering solutions. And although there's no evidence that they ever met, I'd like to think that Nick Begovich really appreciated the work of Ed Cole. Ed Cole was the president of General Motors who really made his mark as the general manager of the Chevrolet division in the 1950s. Of course, they wanted to top the sales charts with their everyday models against Ford, but what Ed Cole did was also quite visionary. Thinking about the fuel-injected cars that were introduced in Chevrolet in the 1950s, and most important, and probably his lasting legacy, is the car I'm driving right now, the Corvair. This is a 1962 Corvair Monza Spider Club Coupe, and it's one of the cars from the Begovich collection, acquired by the Audrain collections. And interestingly enough, this car was actually the everyday car of Joan Begovich. And Joan Begovich obviously was a woman who certainly understood and shared her, her husband's uh, views on cars and what they could mean. She was a school teacher, and I think, I like to think that uh, she was a pretty cool school teacher driving to school in a turbocharged Corvair Coupe in 1962. But back to Ed Cole. The fact that the Corvair even existed, all the Detroit manufacturers were looking for ways to fight the import trend that was just rising. It wasn't a big thing then, but they, they recognized that there was something you need to do to compete in that market segment. And most of the manufacturers simply thought of a smaller version of one of their big cars to beat the Renaults and the Volkswagens and the Hillmans that were coming in. But Ed Cole was thinking of a different packaging solution to this challenge of the imports. And he thought that the rear engine solution that Volkswagen was using offered a great number of opportunities. First of all, you could have a really capacious trunk, flat floors for added space inside the car, and enhanced handling. And when you look at what the Corvair meant also in terms of design, it was a design that influenced European cars that followed for years afterwards. And I think one of the most attractive and interesting Detroit designs, certainly thinking of the fact this designed in the late 1950s, when all the cars on the road from Detroit were filled with chrome and, and other uh, fins and all this going on, the Corvair's elemental design, I think, is really something that's also quite forward thinking. Now, I have to confess that the Corvair is very close to my heart because my very first car was a Corvair, a 1963 Corvair Monza convertible. And I always loved the Corvair. When you think about what this car represents, this turbocharged flat six engine producing 150 horsepower, and this car sold when new for $2,800. The Porsche 356 in 1962 that sold for nearly $4,000 had 90 horsepower did 0 to 60 in 15 seconds. This car did 0 to 60 in 8.5 seconds. This is a real performance statement. Today, driving this car, it's as much fun as it must have been in 1962. Now, of course, Corvairs are indelibly uh, associated with Ralph Nader. And I have to say that it wasn't Ralph Nader that killed the Corvair. Of course, it was the General Motors heavy-handed treatment of the criticism that Nader uh, offered in Unsafe at Any Speed about the Corvair, but he also talked about the Volkswagen and the Porsche and any of the rear engine cars with swing axle suspensions uh, like the Corvair has. And perhaps it was less of a deal in a Volkswagen or even sometimes a Porsche because you didn't have the power that you had in the Corvair available to you, but nevertheless, This Corvair represented a wonderful performance package, but also at a cost. 
what really killed the Corvair was the fact that it was much cheaper to build a Chevy 2, which became the Nova, than it was to build a dedicated architecture around a car with the rear engine and, and all that went with it. And even though they sold millions of these cars, by the standards of Detroit of the day, the car was a failure compared to the Ford Falcon. And the sporting versions of the Corvair, which certainly were a match for any of the sporting versions of the smaller cars from the other Detroit manufacturers, was overshadowed when the Mustang was introduced. And Chevrolet thought they needed to have a more direct competitor and one that would cost them less to build, and so the Camaro came into being. The Corvair in its second generation was a fantastic car that solved all of the suspension issues that had concerned Ralph Nader in this first generation car, but nonetheless it was a bit too little too late. But let's get back to this car. Nick Begovich was very fond of the engineering solutions offered by rear engine cars. He was a great admire, admirer of Hans Ludwinka, the famous designer of Tatra. And I think that for Begovich, this car with its rear engine, the flat six, 150 horsepower, and turbocharging in a family car was something that he could not resist. It's no wonder that this car found a wonderful place in the Begovich collection.